This program is rated PG. It contains themes and scenes which may not be suitable for very young audiences. Parental guidance is advised. We're working to connect a region of over 600 million bridges between our lands. Hello, I'm Alma Angeles. Welcome to ASEAN in Focus. We're coming to you live from Manila in Thailand. Hello, Esther. Hi there, Alma, and good afternoon to all our viewers. I'm Esther Odanga from EBC Thailand Bureau, bringing you the news in the dynamic ASEAN region. On today's headlines. Despite the threat posed by the Omicron COVID-19 variant, the World Health Organization on Tuesday said it's still premature to reintroduce the face shields with the significant public discontent on its mandatory use. A Myanmar junta court on Tuesday postponed giving a verdict in a trial of deposed civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi, who faces a catalog of charges that would see her jailed for decades. Vietnamese President Nguyen Xuan Phuc held talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow as part of the former's ongoing visit to the Russian Federation. And the major squash tournament in Malaysia has been cancelled, the sports governing body said after the Muslim-majority country sparked anger by refusing to grant visas for Israeli players. First in our news, WHO country representative Dr. Rabindra Abiyasinghe said it would be good to focus on samples of people who tested positive in points of entry during the last 10 days or even two weeks to determine if the new COVID variant of concern has entered the country. Let's listen in. I think we need to do whole genome sequencing now and what is important from a uh, genome sequencing perspective is because of the recent or, uh, detection of the uh, variant, we need to rapidly uh, do genome sequencing of the most recent arrivals. Uh, there is a tendency and a delay in the Philippines to be sequencing samples that are four to six weeks arrived, uh, collected earlier. Uh, right now, I think the importance is to focus on those samples of uh, people who detected positive points of entry or recent arrivals during the last 10 days or two weeks because the likelihood of detecting the Omicron virus will be higher. Uh, we need to be aware of uh, the fact that many countries have limited capacity for whole genome sequencing and that's why I'm advocating that any uh, returning uh, traveler overseas should be sequenced at a priority so that we uh, get a head start on being able to detect the arrival of the virus variant in the country. And despite the threat posed by the Omicron COVID-19 variant, the World Health Organization, or WHO, on Tuesday said it is still premature to reintroduce the face shields with a significant public discontent on its mandatory use. WHO country representative Dr. Rabindra Abiyasinghe instead emphasized the importance of observing social distancing, wearing a face mask, and performing hand hygiene. Let's listen in. WHO has right along said that this is a virus is not airborne, right? It's close contact transmission. Uh, and that is why we emphasize that what is important is the physical distancing and the face masking and the hand hygiene. If we can ensure that those minimum requirements, that those minimum public health measures are complied with, if we can ensure that people don't congregate in close settings, the requirement for face shields uh, probably at this point of time is not mandatory because, as I said, we are still looking at understanding the transmission dynamics of 
the Omicron variant. So I think it will be premature now to go there and say we need to reintroduce uh, face shields because we also know that there is significant public discontent on the mandatory use of face shields. So uh, it's better to get public compliance with the measures that are there uh, and take a risk-based approach to reanalyze whether we need to go into uh, the use of face shields or not. Face shields are only required in areas under alert level 5. Local governments and establishments in areas under alert level 4 may require wearing them. It's voluntary in places under lower alert levels. Meanwhile, Indonesians are now reacting over the new Omicron variant of COVID-19, which has rattled global markets and prompted some countries to tighten border controls. Let's hear some of their reactions. Ya, pendapat kayak ya saya jualan kopi, jualan minuman, berharap kalau banyak yang lewat pada ngopi, pada yang minum. Kalau nggak ada, pasti kurang pendapatannya. Iyalah, bingung, ya kan? Pasarnya apa-apa buat nyari anak gitu. Kalau misalnya berkurang juga gimana? Banyak tetangga kawan kita yang meninggal. Dan itu nyata adanya. Saya pun udah melihat itu kuburan DKI itu yang sangat... Saya ikut pun ngubur kawan saya juga ikut... Saya pun ikut kawan saya yang memang meninggal karena COVID ya. Dan itu bukan isapan cepol, memang corona itu benar ada. Jadi dengan Omicron yang sekarang di Afrika Selatan, sangat menakutkan, jujur sangat menakutkan. Warga Jakarta berharap sih bisa dihadanglah penyakit yang baru ini, varian baru ini. Mudah-mudahan Indonesia itu tidak, tidak sampai ke Indonesia, itu aja. According to Antara News, Indonesia has extended its COVID-19 quarantine period for international and Indonesian travelers arriving in the country from three days to one week to anticipate the importation of the Omicron variant or the B11529. The foreign nationals who had ever traveled to South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Lesotho, Mozambique, Eswatini, Malawi, Angola, Zambia and Hong Kong, China, within the past two, uh, 14 days, will be denied entry. For Indonesians who return home from abroad but have ever traveled to the countries, receiving the temporary entry ban, they will be quarantined also for two weeks. The head of U.S. vaccine maker Moderna is telling the Financial Times that existing COVID-19 jabs will struggle against the Omicron variant. And it will take months to develop a new shot that works. Drug companies Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson all say they are now working on Omicron-only vaccines in a repeat of last year's jabs race. In other news, the Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology, or FIVOX, on Tuesday confirmed a phreatic eruption occurred at Mount Pinatubo this afternoon. Weak explosion at Mount Pinatubo was recorded between 12.09 p.m. to 12.13 p.m. The Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology, or, or FIVOX, reported Tuesday afternoon. This generated a plume that was detected by Japan's Himawari-8 satellite. This, this seismic and infrasound signal are not typical of known volcanic processes and are currently being evaluated together with other potential sources, FIVOC said in an advisory. It added that there has been very low seismic activity in the past days, discounting magmatic activity beneath the edifice. FIVOC asked the public to refrain from going in the vicinity of Mount Pinatubo. It also advised local government units or LGUs to ban entry into the Pinatubo crater until the source of explosion is determined. Likewise, communities and LGUs surrounding Pinatubo are reminded to always be prepared for both earthquake and volcanic hazards and to review, prepare, and strengthen their contingency, emergency, and other disaster preparedness plans. Mount Pinatubo has been at alert level zero or normal since August 12. Meanwhile, a Myanmar junta court on Tuesday postponed giving a verdict in the trial of deposed civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi, 
who now faces a catalog of charges that could see her jailed for decades. The court, which had been expected to rule on her trial for incitement against the military, a charge that carries a three-year prison term, adjourned the verdict until December 6, according to a source with knowledge of the case. A verdict on a separate charge that Suu Kyi breached coronavirus restrictions during elections her party won last year, punishable by six months in jail or a fine, was deferred to the same date. David Matheson, an analyst formerly based in Myanmar, told AFP it was a bizarre postponement. And there are obviously more politically motivated factors behind this than legal procedures as it is a farcical show trial, he said. Suu Kyi and ousted President Nguyen Mint were hit with new corruption charges late Tuesday related to the purchase of a helicopter when they were in government, the junta's information team said in a statement. And the statement didn't provide details on when the charges, which carry a maximum sentence of 15 years in jail, would be brought to court. Days after the coup, Suu Kyi was hit with obscure charges for possessing unlicensed walkie-talkies and for violating coronavirus restrictions during elections her National League for Democracy won in 2020. The junta has since added a slew of other indictments, including violating the Official Secrets Act, corruption and electoral fraud. Suu Kyi now appears most weekdays at the junta courtroom with her legal team saying last month the hectic schedule was taking a toll on the 76-year-old's health. Her long spells of house arrest under a previous junta were spent at her family's colonial era mansion in Yangon where she would appear before thousands gathered on the other side of her garden fence. Min Ong Leng's regime has confined her to an undisclosed location in the capital with her link to the outside world, limited to brief pre-trial meetings with her lawyers. An Afghan asylum seeker set himself on fire in Indonesia on Tuesday in protest at his seven-year wait for resettlement in a third country, a local refugee coordinator said. The man suffered severe burns and was sent to hospital. He was taking part in a rally with other displaced Afghans outside the office of United Nations Refugee Agency in Medan on Sumatra Island, coordinator Muhammad Juma said. Thousands of refugees, more than half of them from Afghanistan, are stuck in limbo in Indonesia while they wait for resettlement elsewhere as Jakarta prohibits them from working legally. The man has been in the Southeast Asian country since the beginning of 2016, Huma told journalists. The coordinator said at least 14 Afghan refugees had taken their own lives in Indonesia in recent years and, other, and six others had attempted suicide. He called the Indonesian government and the UN to do more to address the plight. Mitra Salima Suryono, a spokesperson for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, said the agency was closely following the incident. A major squash tournament in Malaysia has been cancelled, according to the sport's governing body. After the Muslim-majority country sparked anger by refusing to grant visas for Israeli players. It's the latest instance of the Southeast Asian nation, which has no diplomatic relations with Israel, bearing the country's athletes. The World Team Championship for Men had been due to take place in Kuala Lumpur on December 7 to the 12th, with 26 squads participating. But the World Squash Federation, or WSF, and Malaysia Squash Body said that it had been axed because of the possibility that some nations would be unable to compete due to the lack of confirmation over the issuing of visas. WSF President Zina Woolridge said sports officials had sought to influence the highest authorities of Malaysia to ensure the ability of all participating teams, including Israel, to enter Malaysia and compete. Israel Squash Association previously said that countries which participated in a tournament from which Israel was barred would be closing their eyes to racism and discrimination. The WSF said the decision to cancel the event was also influenced by the new Omicron coronavirus variant, which it fears could affect travel to Malaysia. 
In 2019, Malaysia was stripped of the right to host the World Para Swimming Championships for threatening to refuse Israeli athletes. And in 2015, Israeli windsurfers had to pull out of a competition on the island of Langkawi after being refused visas. The Palestinian cause enjoys widespread support in Malaysia, where about 60% of the population are ethnic Malay Muslims and entry into the country on an Israeli passport is forbidden. Meanwhile, the Philippine National Police, or PNP, on Wednesday began accepting applications for those who want to be exempted from the ban on firearms and security detail for next year's election. The PNP will assist in the issuance of threat assessments and will endorse the approval to grant to application through the Joint Security and Control Center if it is deemed urgent and necessary, PNP Chief General Leonardo Carlos said in a statement. Carlos said the application period for the issuance of certification of authority for gun ban exemption will run until May 25, 2022. The filing of application may be done online through the Commission on Elections or Comelec official website www.comelec.gov.ph. In Resolution 10728, the poll body has set regulations on the ban on the bearing, carrying, or transporting of firearms or other deadly weapons, and employment, availments, or engagement of the services of security personnel or bodyguards during election period from January 9, 2022 to June 8, 2022, or a total of 150 calendar days. The same resolution provides that only personnel of the PNP Armed Forces of the Philippines or AFP, the Philippine Coast Guard, as well as members of other law enforcement agencies are allowed to carry and possess firearms while in agency prescribed uniform and performing official functions during the election period. Meanwhile, the COMELEC prohibits candidates or any public officers from employing bodyguards and private security forces. All political aspirants will be informed through a letter that their security detail will be recalled. And the news continues here on ASEAN in Focus. Esther and I will be back right after this. Welcome back. The World Health Organization has warned blanket travel bans will not prevent the spread of Omicron as more countries rush to impose curbs and the first cases of the new COVID strain were detected in Latin America. In the week since the new virus strain was reported by South Africa, dozens of countries around the world have responded with travel restrictions, most targeting Southern African nations. But the World Health Organization warned on Tuesday that blanket travel bans risk doing more harm than good just as Canada expanded its restrictions. In a travel advisory, the WHO warned the bans could ultimately dissuade countries 
from sharing data about the evolving virus. But it did advise that unvaccinated people vulnerable to COVID-19, including over 60s, should avoid travel to areas with community transmission of the virus. WHO Chief Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said it was understandable for countries to seek to protect their citizens against a variant we don't yet fully understand. But he also called for the global response to be calm, coordinated, and coherent, urging nations to take rational, proportional risk reduction measures. The likely futility of broad travel restrictions was underscored, as Dutch authorities reported that Omicron was presented in the country before South Africa officially reported its first cases on November 25. The new variant, whose high number of mutations the WHO believes may make it more transmissible or resistant to vaccines, was found in two Dutch test samples from November 19 and 23, with one having no travel history. And so far, well over a dozen countries and territories have detected cases, including Australia, Britain, Canada, Hong Kong, Israel, Italy, and Portugal. In Asia, governments continued Wednesday to expand restrictions, including with Indonesia adding Hong Kong to its travel ban list alongside various African nations. In a statement on Tuesday, the World Health Organization Director General said that it was deeply concerning that Botswana and South Africa, where the new variant was first identified, were being penalized by others for doing the right thing. Dozens of countries have imposed travel bans on the Southern African nations since the mutation was discovered at the end of last week. As scientists race to understand how virulent and transmissible the new Omicron variant is, WHO is urging the use of available precautions to stop the spread. Let's watch this. I might be a higher transmissibility according to initial uh, reports and there might be um, uh, immuno break, um, but hence we're deeply looking at it. But you're fully right on the first sentence. We still need a couple of weeks to get the details together and to know exactly what we're dealing with. As we don't have any full picture of this variant, um, as long as we don't know how, how well or not well the vaccines, the existing vaccines are working, how the treatment is catching up, how transmissible it is, how severe it uh, attacks uh, people, um, we need to use the measures that we know and we use, need to use the measures that we know that work. And that is, as Rial just shows you in the picture, the, mac, the mask wearing um, whenever possible and advisable as long as you're in a in a room uh, with more than one person, uh, ventilating a room if possible, as often as as possible, um, keeping the normal hand and body hygiene, especially hand and mouth hygiene in, that, in those circumstances. So we know these measures work. Omicron is not, not the only variant out there. It's now high on the agenda of interest because it jumped up. Uh, let's not forget there's Delta out there and there's a COVID-19 pandemic even without the Omicron variant and all these measures work a high vaccination rate in, in in the population works we know that the emergency rooms and the centers are full of people with uh, who are to the most most percentage the unvaccinated the most severe diseases and the most severe outcome until death is most often in those unvaccinated and that's of high importance don't forget that life-saving in uh, operations or in, in interventions with people of non-COVID nature, cancer treatments is being postponed for months for people who urgently need them because of full emergency wards and hospitals. So let's not forget that and let's use all the measures we have right now until we know more. Meanwhile, the Philippine National Police on Wednesday reported no new COVID-19 cases, keeping its active cases tally at 45.
In its latest COVID-19 bulletin, the PNP Health Service also recorded nine new recoveries, raising the tally to 42,028 out of a total of 42,198 confirmed infections since the start of the pandemic. The death toll, meanwhile, remains at 125. Meanwhile, fully vaccinated PNP personnel are placed at 93.52%, which is equivalent to 211,176. About 12,744 personnel or 5.64% have already received their first dose, while 1,883 personnel or 0.83% remain unvaccinated. Meanwhile, the National Capital Region Police Office or NCRPO lauded all police officers for the peaceful conduct of the Bayanihan Bakunahan National COVID-19 Vaccination Days, which began on Monday and will end on Wednesday. Meanwhile, Secretary Carlito Galvez Jr. said South Korea's donation of 539,430 doses of AstraZeneca vaccine is timely and significant as it coincides with the massive three-day vaccination campaign that aims to administer 9 million doses across the country. National Task Force Against COVID-19 Chief Implementer said. South Korean Ambassador to the Philippines Kim In-chul expressed hope that the contribution would help a little bit the Philippine government's efforts to fight the coronavirus. Let's listen in. Filipinas are 500 certain. Our cooperation is not a standing still thing. It's not something for, uh, of the past. We keep uh, working hard until we overcome this crisis and we'll stand um, hand in hand uh, working together. The good thing there is that uh, we have accounted for 2.1 million first dose and more or less 400 uh, second dose and only 61 uh, boosters. So meaning it really gave us a lot of, um, uh, of uh, momentum on getting, getting hold of the unvaccinated. He said South Korea gave cash assistance of 1 million U.S. dollars to help the country fight the pandemic. Ambassador In Chul said Korea would donate another 1 million U.S. dollar next year to aid the country's pandemic response. The three-day vaccination campaign dubbed as Bayanihan Bakunahan started last November 29 and ends December 1. The government's pandemic response task force is eyeing another round of massive vaccination campaign from December 15 to 17 to ramp up inoculations and reach its target of vaccinating 54 million people by the end of the year. A total of 27,600 doses of COVID-19 jabs were administered by the city government of Manila at the opening of the three-day Bayanihan Bakunahan National Camp vaccination campaign last Monday. The data released by the Manila Public Information Office showed that 13,873 availed of the first dose, 6,968 got the second dose, and 6,759 were given booster or additional shots as of 8 p.m. Monday. For the pediatric vaccination, 7,566 aged 12 to 17 also availed of free vaccines, 3,635 for the first dose, and 3,000 931 for the second dose. Department of Health data showed the National Capital Region administered 139,812 doses on Monday, more than its committed target of 89,900. The capital city has already breached its goal of at least 1 million to achieve population protection. In other news, Prime Minister Payu Chan Ocha will make a decision about whether Thailand will be forced back into another lockdown if the Omicron variant variant of COVID-19 is detected in the country. However, the new strain has not been found in Thailand yet, according to the health authorities. Speaking after Tuesday's cabinet meeting, Deputy Prime Minister and Energy Minister Supatanapong Punmi Chow said the cabinet instructed relevant agencies to monitor the situation closely while the public health ministry will assess the country's reopening in two weeks time deputy public health minister sati pito techa urged the public to not panic saying the prime minister has ordered security agencies to intensify border surveillance to prevent illegal border crossing to help keep the virus at bay mr Satit also said that nightlife 
venues may be allowed to reopen on January 16 if the Omicron strain is not detected. Though he stressed the need to continue following DMHTT guidelines referring to social distancing, mask wearing, hand washing, temperature checking, and using of Tai Chana or Tai Wing application. Cambodia has decided to ban entry of travelers from 10 African countries in a bid to prevent the spread of the Omicron variant of COVID-19. And the ban is effective from December 1 and includes anyone who has visited them in the past three weeks. This followed the announcement of similar travel ban policies enacted by the U.S., U.K., E.U. and other nations, including neighbors such as Thailand for countries in the region of Africa, where the variant was first detected. The 10 restricted countries are Botswana, Eswatini, Swaziland, Lesotho, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Angola, and Zambia. Separately, Phnom Penh, Municipal Governor Kuang Shreng has decided to allow the reopening of entertainment businesses that were previously deemed high risk for COVID-19 transmission and shut down for an extended period, including karaoke parlors, nightclubs, and discotheques in Phnom Penh, effective from November 30. Speaking at the inaugural ceremony of the Orange Cancer Clinic on November 30, Mr. Strang said the decision to reopen the entertainment sector was due to the high rate of vaccination in Cambodia. Vietnam is expected to welcome the first group of Thai tourists under an ongoing vaccine passport trial program this month, a top tourism official says. Vietnamese tourism officials would work with Thai counterparts to set up a travel bubble scheme as Thailand has proved successful in welcoming international tourists amid COVID-19 with the Phuket Sandbox model, Nguyen Trung Khan, head of Vietnam National Administration of Tourism, said at the seminar on Vietnam's tourism recovery plan. The Phuket Sandbox program allows travelers who are fully vaccinated to enter the island city of Phuket without quarantine from July 1, and the tourism model has been since expanded across Thailand. Foreign tourists with vaccine passports from over 60 countries and territories, including Vietnam, are exempt from mandatory quarantine upon arrival. The Vietnamese government also plans to resume regular international flights to 15 countries and territories with high vaccination rates, including Thailand, from December. Thailand was Vietnam's fastest-growing tourist market before the pandemic, with the number of visitors from that country rising by 46% year-on-year to 509,000 in 2019. And sad news from Vietnam. A 12-year-old boy in the southern Binh Phuoc province died on Tuesday after receiving the Pfizer vaccine, marking the third death among children following COVID vaccinations in the country. He received his first shot of the vaccine on Monday afternoon, and then he was sent home in Dongpu district to rest. After having dinner, he started suffering from dizziness, abdominal pain, and defecation. His family took him to a local hospital before he was transferred to the General Hospital of Bin Phuoc and then a hospital in HCMC, but the boy could not make it and died Tuesday morning. Bin Phuoc Department of Health has set up an expert panel to determine the cause of death. The Bin Phuoc boy was the third to die in the campaign drive. A 16-year-old boy in the northern Bac Giang province and a ninth grade girl in Hanoi died on Tuesday following vaccination with the Pfizer vaccine. The health ministry has said the cause of the deaths was overreaction to the vaccine and not linked to the quality of the vaccine or the vaccination process. And the news continues here in ASEAN in Focus. We will be back after this short break. Alam namin ang iyong pagsisikap. Dama namin ang iyong mga sakripisyo. Kita namin ang pagharap mo sa bawat pagsubok. Kaya sa kabila ng mga hamon ng buhay, nandito kami para umalalay. Kasi katulad mo, gusto rin namin ang magandang bukas para sa kanya. 
Hatid namin ang dekalidad na edukasyon at makabagong pasilidad sa abot kayang halaga. Kaya huwag ka na mangamba, sasamahan ka namin ito pa rin ang mga pangarap niya. Maaasahan mong sulit dito ang mga pinagsikapan mo. Sa aming mga makabagong pasilidad at sistema ng edukasyon, Ilalabas natin ang aking talino at mga kakayahan niya. Kahit sa munting halaga, makakasiguro ka na makakasabay siya sa mabilis na pag-ikot ng mundo. Sa New Era, karamay mo kami sa bawat hamon. Kaagapay mo kami sa bawat hakbang. Kasama mo kami sa bawat niti. at tagumpay. Hindi talaga natin may iwasan ang gulo. May mga magulong magsayaw. May magulong magsalita. Hi guys! Welcome to Danny. Ano daw? ASMR tayo habang umiinom tayo ng tubig. Sa kanya naman, life is too big. Ang epicenter ng katawanan. At interactive games, yun. Oo, yes or no. Dito po ba kakain, sir? Ah, hindi. Doon lang sa lamesa kasi maraming tao dito. Nakakaya. Ang gulo. Paniest Nakabol Videos. Welcome back. Despite the looming threat of Omicron variant of coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19, Malacanang on Tuesday said it is confident that the Philippines could still achieve its target of 4% to 5% economic growth by the end of 2021. In August, the government slashed its economic growth target to 4% to 5% from the previous 6% to 7%. to reflect stricter mobility restrictions declared to prevent the spread of the Delta variant of COVID-19. Watch this. Um, nagsalita na rin po ang NEDA at ang ating mga economic managers tungkol dyan. We are confident. No? To now, we are confident na mararating natin yung ating economic growth targets. Um, uh, and uh, barring any unforeseen circumstances, No, kung patuloy itong pagbaba ng kaso, patuloy rin po yung uh, pagbaba rin ng mga ADAR, ang two-week growth rate, ang, uh, pat pati patuloy pa rin po yung safe reopening natin ng ating ekonomiya, then we're very confident that we will reach our growth targets. Kaya nga po, panawagan natin sa lahat, kailangan uh, magpakuna po tayo, uh, mas marami taong mapakunahan natin, then... Uh, Mas uh, maging kampante po ang lahat, ang negosyo, ang mga livelihoods, ang trabaho. Uh, mas magiging bukas din po ang ating ekonomiya, especially pag nakikita natin na mas marami sa ating mga kababayan amunado at nakikita natin yung result. Yung result ng lahat ng ginagawa nating uh, pagbabakuna ng ating mga kababayan, yung tuluyang pagbaba ng mga numero ng COVID-19 cases natin sa buong bansa. Socioeconomic Planning Secretary Carl Kendrick Chua earlier expressed optimism in reaching the country's 4% to 5% growth goal as COVID-19 cases decline, vaccinations peak up, and, econom and economy gradually reopens. The, the Duterte government is currently balancing between the management of COVID-19 and the safe reopening of the economy. In other news, President uh, Vietnamese President Nguyen Xuan Phuc on Tuesday held talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow as part of the former's ongoing visit to the Russian Federation. President Nguyen expressed his pleasure to visit Russia again and meet with President Putin, a great and close friend of the Vietnamese people, he said. President Putin spoke highly, meanwhile, of Vietnam's socio-economic development achievements. as well as the country's prestige on the international arena, affirming that Russia always regards Vietnam as its leading strategic partner in the region. 
In a trusted, sincere, and open atmosphere, the two presidents discussed and agreed on major orientations and measures to open up a new cooperation era of the two countries, comprehensive strategic partnership with a vision to 2030. The leaders also compared notes on a wide range of regional and international issues of shared interest, as well as the side's coordination to contribute to peace, stability, and prosperity around the world. They share the view that the Vietnam-Russia political diplomatic ties features with high level of strategic thrust or trust thanks to regular contacts and meetings at both bilateral and multilateral frameworks despite adverse impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, in our news, Singapore and Malaysia ease coronavirus travel restrictions on one of the world's busiest land borders Monday after nearly two years, allowing some vaccinated people to cross without quarantine. Take a look. Pretty much I'm excited to go back to my Malaysia, to my home country. Uh, I know a lot of families have been stuck in, your Malaysia, in Singapore. Uh, this has been a good opportunity for me to go back to uh, Malaysia to visit my grandparents, my parents, my families and stuff, yeah. Uh, I feel happy to be able to go back and to meet my families finally after two years. Uh, but I do feel a bit nervous because uh, this is the first batch and I'm not really sure what will happen uh, if there's any unexpected thing happens later throughout the process. For the surprise, just, uh, just directly walk into the house. I don't think they know we are coming back. So after two years, yeah, it will be a big surprise. Before the pandemic, about 300,000 people used to commute across the border from Malaysia every day to the neighboring city-state to work in areas ranging from public transport to electronics manufacturing. But most travel was abruptly halted in March last year, leaving many who previously commuted and other Malaysians in Singapore effectively stuck there as they needed to continue working. From Monday, vaccinated Singaporeans and Malaysian citizens, those holding permanent residency status and work permits can cross the one kilometer or 0.6 mile causeway separating the countries without having to quarantine. Initially, around 3,000 people a day will be able to cross using special bus services and will have to take a virus test. Officials say the first stage is aimed at workers who have been unable to see families for some time, and they plan to expand it later to other groups. Restrictions were also eased one day on air travel, with vaccinated people allowed to fly between the country's main airports without quarantining. Good for them. Thank you, as, as always, Esther, for keeping me company today here in ASEAN in Focus. Keep safe. You're welcome, Alma. You're welcome. And also greetings to all our viewers in Southeast Asian nations and to Brother Belen Regalado, who's always supporting us. And that is the latest news in the Southeast Asian region. Thank you for joining us today here in ASEAN in Focus. I'm Master Adanga from EBC Thailand Bureau, and we live in interesting times. And before we go, I would like to greet our uh, Mom Babylin, Sister Babylin uh, Manalo, a very happy birthday po. Happy, happy birthday po from all of us here uh, on uh, in ASEAN and ASEAN bureaus as well. Thank you. A uh, happy birthday. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. We'll see you back uh, tomorrow here on ASEAN in Focus. Same time, same place. I'm Alma Angeles. We live in interesting times.